Good evening and welcome to the Monday, June 8th Maplewood City Council meeting. I want to start out this meeting a little bit different tonight. I want to start it off with a moment of silence in memory of George Floyd. So for council members and staff and all those listening, um, we'll begin our moment of silence. Thank you, everyone. Watching George Floyd in front of our eyes was gut-wrenching and it was disturbing. These were several of the most horrifying minutes on video that I have ever witnessed. Mr. Floyd struggles to breathe and he cries for help while the officer appears indifferent, kneeling on his neck, cutting off his ability to breathe and the other three officers failed to intervene. I was outraged and sickened by what I saw. Our hearts go out to the Floyd family. I'm saddened for the people of color in Minneapolis, St. Paul, here in Maplewood and across our nation. We stand with all those calling for institutional reforms. As an attorney and public official, I hold the values of our constitution dear. Through the course of our nation's history, the right to protest has forced people to pay attention to injustice and it has moved them to action. Let's keep up that momentum because what's happening in our communities reminds us how much further we have to go when it comes to social justice and creating equitable opportunities in education, employment, housing, and how our communities are policed. After processing the initial horror, my mind focused to Maplewood, our community, our public safety department, and specifically our police officers. I asked myself, had I as a council member and now mayor done all that was in my power to make Maplewood a more equitable community that ensures harmony, justice, and equitable opportunities for all in our community? Indeed, I've received numerous calls and emails asking what is Maplewood doing? Some calling for defunding our police department, others demanding change, and others simply asking, what are we doing? Of course, we all need to do much, much more. I and the members of this council don't have all the answers. We need the community's help going forward. We can and must continue doing this together. Acknowledging that we've taken only incremental steps on a long, complicated journey, there are points of pride in what Maplewood and our community members have accomplished so far. I'd like to start by recognizing Public Safety Director Scott Nadeau, whom I'll call on in just a few moments. In the last three years, our police department has made significant progress improving our policing practices, engaging the community, and hiring officers that better reflect Maplewood's demographics. Even before Chief Nadeau arrived, we had witnessed systemic issues that needed to be addressed. In 2014, we saw the unrest in Ferguson and New York, and by 2016, with the killing of Philando Castile here in Minnesota, enough was enough. Then Chief Paul Schnell, at the direction of myself, and council members Juniman and Smith, who are on council with me, developed Maplewood's response. We started the Use of Force Task Force. It helped us set the groundwork for reshaping our approach to policing. Council member Neblet served on that task force and now sits on the council. In the last 
In the last few years, our efforts have gone far beyond focusing on just policing. Maplewood prides itself on a high quality of life, a great place to live, work, and raise a family. Policing alone will not help us ensure that. We need to build all of the community support systems that lead to success. The council adopted community inclusiveness as one of our strategic objectives by which we measure and make all of our decisions. The strategic objective states that we will strive to create a community that is engaged, tolerant, and compassionate about everyone. To further build a community that embraces and respects diversity and that uses different perspectives and experiences to build an inclusive and equitable city for all. As elected leaders, we have all worked closely with our two school districts to help them pass construction referendums to build world-class educational facilities that meet students' evolving needs. Both superintendents came in during that effort and showed us photos of how far into disrepair our schools had become. We as a council and as a community supported these important educational initiatives because our students are our future. Students need good jobs and a pathway to middle-class careers. That's why we partnered with a St. Paul nonprofit to host a high school career fair, which attracted more than 300 students with diverse backgrounds from a variety of East Metro schools. Everyone deserves a clean, suitable, and safe place to live. After working with our housing providers, Maplewood has launched a rental housing licensing program to force bad landlords to shape up, ensuring clean, secure, well-maintained properties and units for all residents of Maplewood. During the recent demonstrations for social justice, I was heartened to see so many different faces in the crowds. That's important because while Minneapolis, St. Paul, Maplewood, and some other first ring suburbs have diverse populations, their neighborhoods, including some of ours, are less integrated. One of the things I'm most proud of is that when we hold large scale community gatherings, we've been able to bring all of our different backgrounds together in one celebration, giving community members a chance to meet and talk about shared experiences. It's also created a space for them to see our police officers and our officers to see them in a relaxed, informal, non-enforcement setting. It's helped melt some of the tensions because it allows people an opportunity to really connect with each other. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we're not able to hold these gatherings for the foreseeable future. That's why it's so important now that we continue working creatively together on these issues. I'm looking to folks on this DS with me, members of our newly formed Multicultural Advisory Committee and our community as a whole to move Maplewood forward. Inclusiveness is one of our strategic objectives. And if we keep that in the front of our minds, as we all consider what we can do individually and collectively as a council, a resident, or a business, business in Maplewood, we will make true change happen in our city. At this time, I've asked Chief Nadeau to address us and share his perspective on what Maplewood police have done and plan to do as we move forward in the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd. Chief Nadeau. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening to the members of the City Council. The murder of George Floyd on May 25th at the hands of Minneapolis police officers has led to more than just protests, rioting, and arson. It has brought forward some fundamental questions that we all need to answer about race, equal justice, bias, and policing in America. I agree with the mayor. The, the brutal murder of Mr. Floyd at the hands of police officers was one of the most just disgusting things I've ever uh, witnessed. And quite frankly, uh, it made me embarrassed uh, in, in many ways of the profession that I've served in for 33 years. But this is not the first time that these issues have been brought to the forefront as we've seen far too many examples of police use of force ending in the death of an unarmed citizen who too often are people of color. In the wake of this tragic death 
and in a conversation that is occurring both nationally and locally, we have been receiving a lot of questions from our citizens in regards to what is the city of Maplewood and its police department doing in regards to biased policing, equal justice, building relationships, workforce diversity, and use of force issues. I believe that our citizens are right to be asking these questions, and I'd like to give you a brief overview of how Maplewood has been addressing these issues over the course of the last four years. In the wake of yet another tragedy, the police shooting of Philando Castile in July of 2016, the city of Maplewood formed a citizen task force to work with the police to discuss policing and use of force issues. The task force included citizens from diverse communities and a city council representative who spent months and a number of meetings educating themselves on issues concerning policing and police use of force issues. This group, which called itself the Use of Force Task Force, engaged the police department in facilitated dialogue and went through the entire use of force policy and training programs. They wrote an important prologue for the police department's policy manual that serves as the basis for when force is reasonable and in alignment with community standards and priorities. The group's work was an important opening on the difficult issues surrounding police use of force. When their work was done, Maplewood police officers had a better understanding of the support and the expectations of their community in regards to issues regarding force. Wanting to follow up on this work, the city council created a police advisory council, which met several times in an effort to assist the police department and offering guidance on policing issues from a community perspective. The group also performed functions such as sitting on police interview panels so that the community would have input on officers that we would want to be policed in Maplewood. After several months of meetings, it was agreed that the group's work was limited by its charter and other options were explored for a group of citizens comprising our diverse community who could assist the police through input, planning, and assistance. A report suggested that the multicultural advisory committee model prevalent in several Hennepin County communities would be a better and more flexible resource to the police department because of its formation. Recruitment was done and a start date with 12 of our members was established that has now been delayed due to COVID-19 concerns and we are presently looking at forming that group uh, with a starting on a Zoom meeting. We believe that having a dedicated group of community members assisting and advising the police department has shown value and will continue to be an integral part of planning, hiring, advising, and reflection into the future. In addition to working with citizens advisory and task force groups, the police department has taken a number of steps in regards to hiring, training, and connecting with our community in the past three years. In hiring the Maplewood Police Department, working with our human resources department has invested a great deal of time and effort in defining the best applicants for our city and ensuring that they better reflect our diverse community. In the past three years, we have seen a 125% increase of non-traditional police officers going from eight to 18 women and people of color on our police department. We've had to get out of the box about bringing people in with different experiences and different cultural backgrounds in entry level positions, and then assisting them and mentoring them to become great Maplewood police officers. We have prioritized training and have also mandated that all sworn staff complete training in important and impactful topic areas such as crisis intervention training, implicit bias, and de-escalation. More than just firearms and defensive tactics, Maplewood officers increasingly have the tools that they need be successful in 21st century policing philosophies. Just as important as training is putting our police staff in situations where they can build relationships, work with, and get to know the amazing residents that make up the Maplewood community. Starting in 2018, we required every police employee, sworn and non-sworn, to do the important work of getting to know and serve our community. Each staff member is required to be involved in activities that build the important bonds of trust and respect that are vital for us to have that sort of relationship with our community. Our officers now hold dozens of events in our apartment and manufactured home communities. They work with our schools and senior citizen groups to ensure that those relationships are strong. They attend a variety of community events. They volunteer for charitable causes, 
and over 20 of them are currently mentors to children, many of whom are children of color, through our school-based Big Brother, Big Sister program at Weaver Elementary School. We have gone from a couple of dozen hours per year to thousands of hours per year in outreach and service to our community. While this work and these programs are important and impactful, our community also expects transparency in what we're doing and how we use enforcement in our city. In addition to citywide initiatives showing progress on council priorities, the police department also utilizes social media and a number of publications to inform our community. Our police department's strategic plan shows our community what we plan to do and how. Our annual report reflects the accomplishments challenges, and major events that we face that year. Our community information report is one of the most comprehensive summaries of police enforcement activity to include factors such as age, race, other demographics, and issues like victimology that is published by any metro area police agency. The public's concerns around police use of force are valid, particularly in light of events happening in Minnesota and around the country, and every police department needs to be accountable. Whether it's policy, training, or supervision, all three of these play an important role in police use of force encounters. In Maplewood, we're fortunate to have body-worn cameras and policies that mandate their use. Because of body-worn cameras, every use of force incident is examined in detail to ensure that any use of force that was necessary reflects the training and best practices that our community expects. This is a safeguard to both our officers and our community and the best investigative tool when it comes to use of force incidents. Mayor and members of the city council, while I've listed some of what the city and the police department has done in the, in the last four years, I can tell you that we're far from done. Our police department needs and our community expects that we will continue to pursue a path that is just for all of our residents and where every person in Maplewood is respected. We need to continue this important dialogue with our residents, including those from diverse backgrounds and build trusting and respectful relationships with our diverse faith groups and communities. Our multicultural advisory committee, community dialogues and continued efforts on training, building relationships and diversifying our workforce are important next steps. If there are any residents who have questions in regards to any of these issues, we make sure that all of our policies, reports, and publications are available online. For those who have additional questions, of course, we're happy to talk to any resident and share information or hear their concern. I hope that this short summary of the path that we are on for the past four years is helpful for our residents' knowledge. And please know that our entire agency is committed to continuous improvement in this regard, not only this year, but in years to come. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Chief Nadeau. I really appreciate that update. Council members and those present, uh, let's rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Sint, would you please take the roll call for us? Councilmember Smith? Here. Councilmember Knutson? Here. Councilmember Neblet? Present. Councilmember Juneman? Here. Mayor Abrams? Here. Thank you very much for that. Moving on to the approval of the agenda, council members, we got a note uh, from City Manager Coleman that we're going to remove item J3. Uh, City Manager Coleman, would you please uh, give us a little background on that? Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, the applicant will need three different approvals from the city council and they have asked us to uh, withdraw the application tonight so that we could um, do one approval process address all three applications at the same time 
I will add that one of the applications will be about uh, the a ta a tax increment financing request, and that may take more than one meeting, but they've asked to put all of those applications together in one package for your review in the next couple of weeks. Thank you very much. And so uh, with that, I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda with the removal of J3. I move the amended agenda. Second. Moved by Juniman, seconded by Knudsen. Uh, the amended agenda with the removal of J3. Uh, any further discussion? Tonight's order is going to be Council Member Smith, Council Member Knudsen, Council Member Neblet, and Council Member Juniman. So let's start with you, Council Member Smith. Any other comments or discussion? I don't think so. Okay, Council Member Knudsen. No, thank you. Council Member Neblet. No, thank you. Council Member Juniman. No, thank you. Hearing no further discussion, then let's vote on the approval of the amended agenda. Council Member Smith. Aye. Council Member Knudsen. Aye. Council Member Neblet. Aye. Council Member Juniman. Aye. And I vote aye as well. The motion passes the approval of the agenda. Uh, before I jump into the approval of the minutes, I just wanted to remind the council members that uh, at the end of our council meeting, we'll go through that same round robin order and I'll ask each of you for any closing discussion or comments that you'd like to make at the end of the meeting. All right, so moving on to the approval of the minutes, is there a motion to approve the Monday, May 26 Maplewood City Council minutes? So moved. Second. Moved by Neblet, seconded by Juniman. Uh, is there any further discussion? <laughs> Council Member Smith. No, thank you. Council Member Knudsen. No, thank you. Council Member Neblet. No, thank you. Council Member Juniman. No, thank you. All right, hearing none, then uh, let's vote on the approval of the minutes to the May 26th meeting. Council Member Smith. Aye. Council Member Knudsen. Aye. Council Member Neblet. Aye. Council Member Juniman. Aye. And I vote aye as well. Moving on to appointments and uh, presentations. Uh, City Manager Coleman, will you give us the council calendar update, please? Yes, thank you, Mayor Abrams, members of the City Council. The calendar is meant to be informational and intended to provide the council with an indication of things that we're currently planning for upcoming agenda items and for our workshops. As you know, since uh, late March, we have suspended having workshops uh, because of the limitations on having indoor meetings together with social distancing. And until that becomes more favorable or the council decides that they feel safe coming back to work, we will continue to not hold workshops at this time. Uh, we recognize that there are technical and other difficulties uh, with the council having challenges not to be able to meet in person, uh, but unless directed to change that, we will uh, continue to not have workshop items. It is our hope that uh, within the next few weeks, we will be able to do some reinstatement with social distancing so that we can begin uh, discussions on the 2021 budget. Uh, so with that, uh, we have for June 22nd, which will be our meeting in two weeks, we will be doing an overview of the 2021-25 uh, CIP and the 2020 budget adjustments that have been made. Uh, and then on July 13th, we will really get into the details of that capital improvement plan. Uh, with that, Mayor and Council, I would just ask if you have other items that you would like staff to be aware of to uh, bring back information to you. We would be happy to receive that information this evening. Thank you, City Manager Coleman. I wanted to take the temperature of the Council. We had talked at our last meeting about uh, everyone's comfort level about getting back together on June 22nd. And uh, I guess what I'd like to do is we'll do a round robin on this uh, and just see where you are. And of course, we would be socially distanced and uh, following all the guidelines set out by the governor's executive order. 
So that I just wanted to know what you were thinking about that. Council Member Smith. Uh, I'd, I'd say my feelings haven't changed. I, I would defer to others in the group uh, and find the other way. Okay, Council Member Knudsen. I'm fine with coming back to meetings. Okay, Council Member Neblett. Um, Uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot. No, no, that's okay. I'm trying to, um, I am trying to be thoughtful in my head. Um, you know, I, I mean, the, okay. Um, I, I think I would be okay coming back on the 22nd, as long as we have the ability to distance. Okay. Council Member Juneman. I guess I'll go along with the group, although I would prefer July. Okay. Uh, what I would like to ask is, uh, we had talked about this before, about, and I want to make sure everyone is comfortable. We all have our very different circumstances, mm -hmm. and I certainly want to be respectful of that. And so with that in mind, I would like to ha ask uh, City Manager Coleman to work with Mr. Folds on either everyone coming back or in the event that some people would feel more comfortable uh, doing a hybrid where they may be at home uh, with an iPad that we can figure out the technology so that we could start moving towards coming back together. And I would ask that you would kind of put together what our options are so that we could, if some of us were inclined to come back together and do a meeting in person, uh, that we would be able to work that out and then also have the hybrid option if some council members felt more comfortable staying at home, uh, that they could use their iPads. Uh, so mm -hmm. I would ask City Manager Coleman if you could work that out with Mr. Folds. Uh, certainly, Mayor. I know uh, Mr. Foltz has been looking into the options to do that, so we will have something for you in the next few days to let you know how we're going to be able to accommodate that. Wonderful. And I want to thank Mr. Folds for doing such a marvelous job with this technology uh, through this challenging time that we continue to be able to accomplish the city's business. Uh, and, uh, you know, also, I want to thank uh, uh, City Clerk Sint because this is a different way for us to be running meetings as well. So thank you to staff for keeping us up and running with technology. And hopefully we can uh, transition smoothly back to uh, being all together. I know I'm looking forward to seeing everyone. So thank you with that. Our council members, are there any council presentations? I don't think we had any. Okay, then moving on uh, to our consent agenda. I know I wanted to um, highlight number two. I had a question on that. And uh, council members, uh, um, Would anyone like to highlight or discuss any of the other consent agenda items? Council Member Smith. No, thank you. Council Member Knudsen. No, thank you. Council Member Neblett. No, thank you. Council Member Juniman. No, thank you. Okay, my question uh, before we, we uh, uh, consider a motion on this uh, was to ask Mr. Love if he would comment about the Resolution in the consent agenda for reduction of retainage on a construction contract. Uh, uh, can you, uh, Mr. Love, please comment on that? Because uh, from the um, staff notes, uh, it appears that the vast majority of project improvements were completed and so that the contractor is requesting return of uh, a portion or, well, it just says $63,146.95. Could you explain that, please? Is the entire project done? Is there, are we retaining any other fees? Um, could you fill us in on that, please? 
Absolutely, uh, Mayor and Council. So this is uh, project is related to the Wakefield Park uh, building construction project. The project is essentially completed both the building and the landscaping. Um, one of the things that occurred is we had an extended warranty for the landscaping work uh, to ensure that everything came through the winter. Um, that inspection is going to be happening happening within the next few weeks by our consultant. Uh, once that is done, we'll be bringing this item back uh, to you for uh, closure of the project and final payment on the project. So what this one is, is the contractor has requested to reduce the retainage on the portion of the project related to the building, 5% to 0.5%. So overall on the project, we retain 5% of, of the payments as re retainage to make sure that everything gets done and completed. We have $102,913 in, um, in retainage on the project overall. This release is related to the building um, as that is um, all done and we're, we're, we're not looking for any inspection on that yet. Uh, so that release is $63,146, which leaves us about uh, $39,767 of retainage related to the landscaping. So when we bring for this item back towards uh, to council for final payment and acceptance, we would also be releasing the last of the retaining on this project. Thank you for that, Mr. Love. Council members, do I have a uh, motion for the consent agenda? So moved. Moved by Knutson. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Juniman. The motion for the to approve the consent agenda. Items one through three. Uh, I think I'm confident enough that we'll go right to the vote and I don't believe there's any other further discussion on it. <laughs> Let's vote, Council Member Smith. Aye. Council Member Knudsen. Aye. Council Member Neblet. Aye. Council Member Juniman. Aye. And I vote aye as well. We have no public hearings tonight. Moving on to unfinished business. <laughs> Uh, Finance Director Paul Seth, uh, uh, this is yours concerning the award of the sale of GO Improvement Bonds Series 2020B. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Can everyone hear me? I can hear you just fine. Wonderful. I was kicked out once tonight and had to had to log back in, so I just want to make sure everything's working. Um, tonight, the City Council will be considering uh, approving a resolution which will award the sale of General Obligation Improvement Bonds Series 2020B. Uh, the Council authorized the sale of these bonds on May 11th, 2020. The bonds are going to be used to finance the street projects this summer, the reconstruction projects. And um, the, uh, the amount of... Uh, the original amount of the sale was estimated to be $6,875,000. That sale was held this morning um, with some special provisions. The underwriter is offering a, uh, quite a large premium. So in the structure of the bonds has changed. So you do have a revised resolution for a lower amount of the bonds that was provided with supplemental materials this afternoon. Um, our bond consultants, uh, Bruce Kimmel from Ellers facilitated this bond sale along with his colleagues. And he is here tonight to um, give you the details of the sale and give you his recommendations. So at this time, uh, Madam Mayor, I would ask that you recognize Mr. Bruce Kimmel from Ellers. Mr. Kimmel, are you with us? I am Mayor, yes. Welcome. Thank you, and thank you, council members. Um, I'll just give you a brief overview of the sale results. Uh, as Ellie mentioned, we had a very successful sale. Uh, we received five bids on the city's behalf this morning at 10 a.m. And if you have the sale day report in front of you, and if I could ask you to flip to the page, the third page of the PDF um, that's titled Bid Tabulation, you can see that the winning bid came from Northland Securities if you look in the far right hand column that's titled true interest rate, you can see that Northland's bid, all things considered and, and calculated on an apples to apples basis with the other bids, came in at 1.43%. Uh, this is really remarkable and it reflects uh, how low interest rates have come 
since the bond market really uh, stabilized and recovered in starting in early April. And so uh, quite an excellent result. And what's also noteworthy here is even the last place bid from Stiefel Nicholas came in at 1.51%. So only eight basis points or 0.08% of difference between the first place and the fifth place bid, um, which really just indicates how aggressively underwriting firms were competing to win these bonds uh, from the city of Maplewood. I would also point out that when we uh, presented the pre-sale report to the council on May 11th, we had estimated an interest rate of 2.06% for this bond issue. Now, granted, we had some cushion built in. We always try to add in at least 25 basis points or 0.25% just to make sure you know, we're not giving you too, uh, too optimistic, optimistic of a projection. But even when you back that out, we were still almost 40 basis points better than where the market was at in early early May. So uh, congratulations to all of you there for that excellent result. Um, Ms. Paulseth also mentioned the premium bid from Northland. I'll just touch on that briefly. If you see on the top of that bid tabulation page, you can see that Northland's coupon rates uh, started out at 4% and then dropped to 2% after the call date on the bonds. And I won't go into all of the bond math nitty gritty, although I would really like to, but I know you have other things on your agenda. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, you can you can see then in the the column next to that that the reoffering yields those are really truly the the net effective interest rates that the city is paying on each of those maturities, and those are the the interest rates that range from 0.4 percent up to point one or up to 1.6 percent. So that really explains how the overall interest rate is closer to 1.4 percent for the overall 15 year bond issue. Uh, but I just wanted to explain that that's really the basis for the premium bid. And so that was over $600,000 of additional money that they were wanting to pay the city of Maplewood for these bonds. Now, uh, after talking with Ms. Pulsa, we, we confirmed that the city doesn't need additional funding for the two improvement projects that you're undertaking. So we used that net premium along with some unused issuance costs that we had built into the preliminary bond issue to reduce the size of the bonds by that full $675,000. So in case you were wondering how we were able to drop the bond issue yeah. by that much, that's, that's the, the rationale there. Um, why don't I also just touch briefly on the debt service uh, results. I won't go into a lot of detail here, but I would note that after factoring in the lower principal amount of the bonds and the slightly higher coupons on the bonds, still the net result for the city is that over 15 years, you as well as the assessment payers will be paying a total of about $400,000 less on this bond issue than what we had projected back in May. So the, the, the true bottom line result is, is about $400,000 of, of savings as opposed to what we had estimated before the bond issue. And then finally, Mayor and Council members, I did want to touch on the S&P rating affirmation, and those are the last several pages of the uh, sale day report. As you may know, uh, the city's AA plus rating was affirmed with flying colors last week as part of the as part of this bond issuance process. As Ms. Ms. Paul Seth, along with Mr. Rube and Mr. Thompson and Mr. Love, all did an excellent job of preparing for this uh, rating discussion and then uh, sharing information on the phone call with the S&P analyst. And really, uh, this was a very uh, experienced analyst, one who's rated the city before. And she had very few questions because the city had basically answered all of her questions ahead of time. But we did have a, a very uh, productive discussion. Of course, they did have questions about COVID-19 and the effects of the pandemic on the city. And your staff did an excellent job of discussing how you do and don't expect that to impact the city's finances and operations. And really, there were no lingering questions or concerns from that. Um, in addition, I should just note also, um, S&P is aware that next year you plan on financing a new fire station, and then the year after you'll probably have some additional road projects or street projects, and they really had no concerns about that as well. So I can answer any questions you have about specific aspects of the rating report, um, but all in all, it was a very smooth uh, and, and uh, resounding affirmation of the city's AA plus rating. And why don't I just stop there and ask if you have questions about that or about the bond sale. Thank you, Mr. Kimmel. That was an excellent report. And I am 
absolutely thrilled with the results. So let's go through the, our list and see if anyone has any questions for Mr. Kimmel or for Ms. Paulseth. Council Member Smith. Uh, one question, as we are, um, as we are going into a potentially more challenging time as far as um, funding projects and things like that, is this, is this, and we, and we have as a council sort of been pushing to bring down our debt overall, which I have been certainly supportive of, with this, with these lower interest rates though, would it make sense for us to consider taking advantage of those and accelerating some projects in the meantime? Question. Ellie, do you want to go on uh, that first, or or should I give some Mr. Kimmel, please please go ahead first. Okay. Um, thank you, Council Member. You know, we, we get that question a lot, especially when rates are at historic lows like they are now. And, and I, I would have to say that there's really no perfect answer. Um, I think conversations with your, your leadership team, your finance director, your city manager, your public works director, um, getting a handle on what project costs are likely to inflate versus which aren't, and, and what is that likely or possible rate of inflation would really be key considerations because you're, you're touching on something. If you can borrow money at, you know, one and a half percent for 15 years, and that's a fixed rate that is not going to change on you, that's very compelling. Um, but I know the city also has um, indicated an interest in, in, in given direction on a debt reduction policy. Um, and that is also a really valid uh, policy priority. So, you know, I, I would say it, whatever that Goldilocks solution of the right balance between mm -hmm. cash funding for projects and debt funding for projects uh, would be the, the right the right answer for Maplewood, of course. Um, but certainly, if if there are projects that you've been delaying, um, but that really are at you know, a high priority, um, and if if your engineering team and your other uh, you know see, senior management think it's, it's it would make sense to accelerate, we could certainly take a look at that and also take a look at what that would mean for your overall debt load. Um, I did want to mention uh, just really fast. You may have noticed in the S&P report that S&P characterizes your debt profile as, quote, weak. And you may recall that S&P has limited themselves to using just a small handful of descriptors, very strong, strong, adequate, weak, and very weak. So weak isn't really a pejorative. All they're doing is, is measuring how much debt you have uh, as, as measured by a couple of different ratios. And based on those ratios, you fall in that weak category. That said, debt is only 10% of your overall rating. The economy, uh, the local economy, your management, your budgetary performance and flexibility, those all rank higher than debt load alone in your credit rating. So while it's important to keep an eye on your debt and while they've expressed interest at S&P in, in your plans on reducing debt, it's not a, 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 an item of concern in and of itself. Um, so I just wanted to share that if that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Paulseth, did you want to comment at all about I will the make, Thank you, Madam Mayor. I will make a, a short comment. Um, we are, of course, uh, watching our amount of our outstanding debt very, very carefully in Maplewood um, because we are aware of the, the weak rating and, um, and the council's desire to bring the debt down to a more reasonable level. Um, we do want to keep in mind that we have a, a large fire station project that we'll be funding very early next year. We're going to be watching the market very closely over the next six months to determine the right time to issue those bonds. We could issue them as early as January, um, depending on you know what the timing looks like and what the market looks like. So um, $7.1 million is, is the amount that we'll be issuing. It, it, uh, it is possible that there is a small amount of room left in our $10 million limit to issue bonds for roads also next year, but we had not planned on doing that in the interest of keeping the debt down and also keeping the amount of debt service affordable. So um, even, even though the rates um, are excellent, um, we still have to, it still has to fit into Maplewood's affordability plan. We have to fit it into our debt service schedule and look at the impact that it has on the property taxes. So we continually um, analyze those things every time we issue debt, and we will certainly keep this in mind 
um, next year or as we move through this next CIP process, we'll certainly keep it in mind. It doesn't appear at this point that adding a street project would be affordable, but we will certainly continue to analyze that as we move through um, this CIP process and into next year. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilmember Knudsen, do you have any questions? No, I don't have any questions. I have some comments. When I read that letter, um, I didn't have a lot of time, but I read it quickly. But it, the overwhelming uh, tenor of the letter was that we have a strong financial position, strong management, strong leadership. Um, in particular, interest was that uh, what um, was described as the weak condition. It also described a situation where we manage that debt load very well, essentially mitigating that concern because of our debt management. So I just wanted to say how, how strong I think we are recovering from a high debt situation and how, how our ability to move forward is based on the talent we have in Maplewood. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Niblett. No questions, but I guess timing is everything. And thank you staff for being on top of this, um, saving the city $400,000. Uh, there is nothing better to hear. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Councilmember Juniman. No questions. Ditto what was said before me. Thank you, staff. Congratulations one more time. It is so good to be in our chairs and hear that we are in a strong position financially, particularly. Mm -hmm. That was an excellent report. So thank you very much. Uh, Council members, do I have a motion? Now the motion is for the amended resolution, uh, just to keep that in mind, because the one in our packet was still the estimate. And so what we're uh, proposing has uh, is now concerning the $6,200,000 principal for the bond. Is there a motion? I move approval of the resolution awarding the sale of general obligation and improvement bonds series 2020B, mm. original aggregate principal amount of $6,200,000. Is there a second? Second. Moved by Juniman, seconded by Smith, the motion to approve the resolution <clears throat> awarding the sale of the general obligation improvement bonds uh, in the amount of $6,200,000 principal. Uh, all those in favor, or let me ask this, is there any further discussion, <laughs> Council Member Smith? Uh, just want to be clear that my question was just a question that did not have any intent behind it. Uh, I don't necessarily think borrowing more is a good idea. I just wanted to ask the question, but that's all I have to say. Thank you. Council Member Knudsen, any discussion? No, thank you. Council Member Neblet. None, thank you. Council Member Juniman. No, thank you. Okay, now for the vote. Councilmember Smith. Aye. Councilmember Knudsen. Aye. Councilmember Neblett. Aye. Councilmember Juniman. Aye. And I vote aye as well. The motion passes. Thank you, staff, for that excellent report. And thank you, Mr. Kimmel, uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, the next agenda item is the pedestrian crossing policy. Uh, this is Mr. Love. Yes, Mayor and Council, I'm going to go ahead here and share my screen. Hopefully. There we go. Uh, <clears throat> so I have a very short presentation here. Uh, Council, you may recall that we originally presented the proposed pedestrian crossing policy back on uh, February 24th at our uh, council workshop there. Um, we had our consultant in and we went through a lot of the technical aspects of this policy, how it works, how we developed it. Um, tonight, I'm just gonna really kind of touch really on a high level of the purpose, but then concentrate a little bit more on how CAPS looks to implement the proposed plan. So uh, as a reminder, as you guys know, uh, pedestrian and bicycle and are, are important aspects of the city's multimodal transportation system. So providing safe crossings is very important. Um, the purpose of this policy, we really wanna establish guidelines uh, for installation of uh, the crosswalks as well as other safety measures. And these are for the roads that are under the city's jurisdiction. We really wanna be able to bring a way of evaluating these uh, issues and requests that are 
both uh, consistent and equitable throughout our city. As staff, we really, when we looked at the idea of creating a, a policy like this, we really wanted it to be more of a decision-making tool, something that we use and not just a written policy that we're for it. Um, so the policy was developed, um, it, 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 it's gonna allow us to do two things. You kind of see uh, two images off to the right. Uh, these two things, the first is, a, is a, a flow diagram that allows us to identify whether the location is appropriate to have uh, safety measures uh, put in place. If it is, it also then uh, directs us to the uh, second image there with all the boxes, which isn't meant for you to read, but this is a tool that helps us look at, based on site-specific features, what treatment measures, uh, safety measures uh, might be appropriate. So when we look at an implementation plan, uh, we, we really saw three categories of uh, times that we would be using uh, this policy. The first one uh, would be something that we would begin right away on with our capital improvement project. So as we uh, reconstruct streets and we either, um, the streets have pedestrian um, facilities like sidewalks and trails already, or if we're adding them, uh, we would use this policy to evaluate the crossings and make sure that um, we're providing uh, the, the recommended safe uh, crossing measures. So that's kind of a, would be immediate implement, implementation on it. Um, the next one we categorize as reactive. So this would be as we get requests uh, from citizens or issues come up, um, it would, we, we'd be reacting to those. And th that's how we would uh, take in future requests from residents as well. This would give us, uh, this policy would give us a decision-making tool to evaluate all those in, in a very similar manner. And the last one is the proactive uh, evaluations. So for this category, we look, would look primarily at demonstrated safety issues. If we had an intersection where there is a large history of pedestrian accidents, uh, that, you know, that would, we would um, make that a primary proactive evaluation. And then the second way we'd look at proactive evaluation is uh, pedestrian generators. So a good example of this is as we look forward to uh, the potential of a rush line or a gold line, and we're uh, establishing these high volume um, uh, users uh, and these stations, uh, we can use this policy to make sure that the pedestrian crossings in and around um, these stations would uh, make sure that they, they are as safe as possible. So the way that the plan works is uh, initially we would be, if, as, as for all three of these, we would initially do um, a desktop evaluation, and then we would schedule um, field work where we would review the site-specific characteristics as well as collect data, such as uh, traffic levels, pedestrian movements, and then we'll use that information with our policy and those flow diagrams that I, I showed you uh, previously to evaluate the need, if it's appropriate, and, and at what level. Um, again, the, the, the implementation plan and the policy uh, is written so that known safety issues are a priority. And when we talk about being equitable, um, if we have multiple needs and we have limited funding, uh, we wanna make sure that we're also taking a look at where, where we have a higher than average environmental justice population. So, um, we want to make sure that uh, the people that are more likely to be using uh, of such a, uh, like bicyclists and pedestrians and public transportation, we want to make sure we're applying that uh, to those areas first. With that, um, that's the end of my short uh, presentation. I'm available for any questions. Staff does recommend uh, the, the policy uh, to the council for approval. And with that, um, I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Love. That was a very that was a very helpful uh, presentation. Uh, I must say that I really appreciated the slide with the school children waiting for the bus in the snow. Uh, it's 95 out there, I think, right now, and so that was kind of refreshing to look at. So, do we have any questions, Council Members? Council Member Smith. Yeah. So, will we at some point? for the more proactive approaches, will we see it, some sort of list of kind of a priority list or something like that for potential proactive things? 
Yes, uh, Mayor and Council, I, I think we'll be taking a look at things such as where are our major trail crossings, as well as um, some of the, like I mentioned, on our uh, uh, transit, future transit projects. Those would be our potentially our, our initial um, proactive ones. However, I should note it's not, we don't have necessarily a list of known bad areas at this time. Uh, but there, there's still ways for staff to be uh, proactive in 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 using this policy. Right, so I, I understand we don't have a list today. I'm just wondering, will we have kind of a target list that the council can be aware of at some point? Mr. Love. Yes, uh, Mayor and Council. So uh, as far as uh, generating a list, um, Again, I, I think where we're gonna start with is taking a look at the major trail crossings or Bruce Vento and Gateway, as well as the transit uh, stations. And certainly if we do, if we end up with a list of areas that we have to, um, that, that show that we're gonna to need to evaluate them, we'll certainly um, make you aware of that as we move forward with that work. Councilmember Smith, anything else? No, thank you. Okay, Council Member Knudsen? No, thank you. Council Member Neblet? Yes, uh, Mr. Love, just a, a quick question. Does this policy address the, um, like the, the current um, like crossing areas um, that we have? Um, so a lot of them I see are faded. So does this plan take that into, in, into consideration um, for like, putting new coats of paint on it so people can actually see them. Yep. Mayor, Mayor and Council, the, the um, policy doesn't necessarily uh, address the maintenance of them. It's more whether okay. they should be used. I, I will say that I believe we, we remark everything every other year. So we, we mark half the city each year. Um, we refresh the paint on half the city each year. Got it. Thank you. Yes. Councilmember Juniman. No, thank you. Okay. Is there a motion to adopt the pedestrian crossing policy? So moved. Second. Moved by Knudsen, seconded by Neblet. The motion to approve or to adopt the pedestrian crossing policy. Uh, any further discussion? Councilmember Smith. No, thank you. Councilmember Knudsen. No, thanks. Councilmember Neblet. No, thank you. Council Member Juniman. No, thank you. All right, then let's move on to voting. Uh, Council Member Smith, how do you vote? Aye. Council Member Knudsen. Aye. Council Member Neblet. Aye. Council Member Juniman. Aye. And Council Member, uh, uh, I vote aye as well. <laughs> I ran out of the list. <laughs> Okay, so the motion uh, passes to adopt the uh, pedestrian crossing policy. Uh, moving on to new business, we have our 2019 comprehensive annual report. And Ms. Paulseth, this is yours as well. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, even though we are nearly halfway through the year of 2020, we have just recently completed closing out the books for fiscal year 2019. Um, we have been experiencing an audit over the last couple of the months, which is uh, normal. Every year, the city is required to have an audit. Uh, our audit uh, firm is Bergen KDV. Um, and Matt Mayer, the partner um, who's in charge of the audit, is present tonight and he will be giving you a presentation on the results of the audit and he's going to give you a high level summary of the comprehensive annual financial report for 2019. So uh, Madam Mayor, I would request that you could um, recognize Matt Mayer at this time. Certainly. Welcome Mr. Mayor to our council meeting. Are you there? Great. Hello. Hey, I've just been unmuted by the host. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you very right, much. You. Welcome, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Director Paulsith, for the introduction. I appreciate the invitation tonight. 
Uh, I have the results of the audit for 2019 to share with you and a little bit of financial analysis as well. I think uh, Director Paul says set things up very well uh, by describing the audit process to you. It is the city's responsibility each year to prepare financial statements for the public and our job as your auditors is to test, examine, and give an opinion on those statements so that users of them can be assured of their accuracy and uh, trust them for a true picture of the city's financial position and results of operations. We provide that assurance through an independent auditor's report, which you'll find in front of the financial statements. We're providing you an unmodified or clean opinion, which is the best that we can offer. It means that the numbers we'll be looking at in a little bit are a true and accurate picture of the city's financial position and results of operations. We have two additional reports that we're issuing that came in a separate document with your materials. One of those is a report on government auditing standards. And the main objective of that report is to provide a report on internal control. And internal control are the policies and procedures that you as a city have instituted to safeguard the city's assets and to ensure accurate financial reporting at the end of each year. If we have any significant deficiencies or material weaknesses in internal control in our opinion, we bring them out through that report. We had none for 2019, so a clean, good report for you there as well. And then finally, uh, the Office of the State Auditor requires that we test you on various statutes that apply to municipal in the state of Minnesota. We're talking about things like how you deposit and invest the city resources, uh, how you do contracting and bidding, making sure there's no conflicts of interest with anyone in administration or the council. And again, if we have any uh, findings, we bring them out through that report. We had none for 19, so a clean report there as well. So I'm providing three reports tonight. All three are the best or the cleanest that I can provide. So I think the 2019 uh, audit can be very much considered successful. Uh, credit to the finance team under the uh, leadership of Director Paul Seth and our thanks to them as well for their uh, um, compliance with all of our requests throughout the process. A little bit different year this year. We did everything mostly remotely with the city and I I think we have a very high, very high quality product to uh, review with you this evening. So with my remaining time, I'd just like to provide you some analysis on the city's general fund as well as the enterprise funds of the city. I choose these because these are the funds that the city uh, has the most input on, and it's these are the funds that citizens typically interact with the most. When they think of the city of Maplewood, they're generally interacting with the operations of one of these the first is the general fund, and the general fund covers the main uh, operations of the city, everything from public safety uh, to streets to park and recreation. So again, the one the uh, citizens are most uh, comfortable with and uh, most known for, the city's most known for. Revenue for the year in the uh, general fund was up about 3.2%, about 133,000 from the prior year. Uh, it represented about 1.1 million of that. And State aids were actually down about $389,000 from the prior year. That had to do with the way that you've chosen to allocate your LGA or local government aid from the state. Rather than using it in the general fund this year, you were able to dedicate that to some other funds within the city for other purposes. If we look at the revenue budget, which is the way that I would recommend uh, evaluating the performance of the general fund, uh, revenue was actually over budget this year by about $376,000. There was a uh, grant from related to registrar, deputy registrar activity that put intergovernmental revenue over budget. License and permit activity was stronger than anticipated. And the largest variance was actually in investment income this year. I think we had a conservative budget to begin the year, but it was actually a very strong year performance wise for the city's investments, yielding additional income over and above the estimated amount. So uh, I'm going to have you evaluate the general fund in two ways. One, whether you uh, execute it on your budget or not. And then secondly, we're going to talk financial position at the end. And uh, for sure, on the revenue side, the budget was executed very well. The projections that administration provided were pretty much spot on in the variance, but it was a positive one of $376,000 or a little less than 2%. 
The sources of revenue for the year in the general fund, about 78% came from property taxes. And the next highest was intergovernmental at 7.1%. If you go back a year, that number is about 75% for taxes and 9% for intergovernmental. And again, that's a function of the levy going up in the general fund and then utilizing some of that LGA outside of the general fund year over year. But I want to stress the importance of the property tax levy as it relates to the health of the general fund. You were speaking earlier about your uh, credit rating uh, when your bond issuance occurred. And one of the things that they look at is the general fund health and the stability of the revenue flow there. And I think a big function of that was the fact that uh, almost 80% of your general fund revenues are coming from property taxes, a uh, secure and known revenue stream as opposed to some of these others that might be variable depending on the economy and other factors. If we look at spending in the general fund for 2019, it was about $250,000 or only 1.3%. So spending was relatively flat year over year. Again, I'm gonna have you look at that in the context of the budget and the administration did an excellent job executing on your budget. And as you can see here, department by department across the board, all department heads executed on their budget and came in under the spending parameters that you set for them. So savings for the year when it came to the general fund budget was $767,000, about 3.5% under budget for 2019. A couple of large numbers jump out at you. One of those is police. Uh, those were just the typical vacancies that occur in the department throughout the year. Typically we budget at full uh, capacity or full staffing and that uh, typically throughout the year does not occur. And then public works as well. Uh, there was a conservative budget there for some of the projects, the maintenance and the other work that needed to occur and ultimately they were able to execute below the threshold that you established for them as well. So uh, again, using my two measuring sticks, the general fund budget was executed very well uh, by administration according to your wishes for 2019. As we look at where the dollars are being spent, public safety is a priority of the city. About 45% of the budget goes to police, another 11% to the fire department, uh, representing about 56% of the budget for 2019. Public works, about 20% of the budget, and you can see administration coming in at about 8%. If we go back a year, uh, those numbers are almost identical. It's almost like I didn't even change the slide here because they're so close. And that indicates to us a very strong budget process. The council consistently from year to year has a, uh, their priorities in line as to where they want the dollars to be spent. That's uh, memorialized in a budget handed off to administration and administration has excellent controls in place to ensure that that budget is executed according to the plan that you as the council laid out. If we put everything together, uh, ultimately then, because of the outperformance on the budget for the year, your fund balance went up in the general fund from an unassigned fund balance of $8.8 .8 million to begin the year to a $10.1 million fund balance to finish the year. That's a significant increase in real dollars, about $1.3, $1.4 million overall. But I would encourage you to look at it as a percentage of spending instead, because as the budget changes, uh, each year from inflation, uh, a nominal dollar approach to looking at your fund balance doesn't really work. Let's look at it as a percentage of spending either this year's or next year's. And you have a policy that you want your fund balance to be at least 40% of a year's worth of spending with a goal of 50%. And if you do the math on your unassigned fund balance at the end of 2019, it's at 49.4%. So well ahead of your minimum threshold, and just uh, bumping your head up against the maximum or the, the desired threshold that you've established for yourself. So my second metric for you when it comes to general fund operations or financial health is are you in line financial health wise with the policy that you've set for yourself? And the answer to that is yes. You're with that 40, or 50, 40 to 50% uh, range and you're actually on the high end of that range with the 49.4% fund balance to end the year. So I think an excellent report for your general fund operations. I wanna talk briefly about each of your enterprise funds, and we're gonna look at those a little bit differently. As the name implies, 
enterprise uh, is intended to be run like a business. So what we're looking here is user fees covering the main cost of operations, and we can decide whether the user fees are adequate by whether or not this fund is generating operating income. You're gonna see in each of these charts, revenue is in green, expenses are in blue, uh, operating income is in gray, and if depreciation is significant, we're factoring that out and showing operating income without depreciation in orange. The ambulance fund has had a couple of very good years. Uh, management of this fund is doing good work for you. The call volume has gone up as well, and the collections, which are always a challenge in the ambulance service, are also up as well. So as a result, revenue, you can see, has increased significantly each of the last couple of years, generating solid operating income as well. Uh, it takes about $3 million to run this fund on an annual basis, and that's just what your fund balance was at the end of 2019, about $3 million. About $1.2 million of that in cash, and another $1.8 tied up in receivables. And that's also the challenge in the ambulance uh, fund is just collecting on those receivables that are out there. The city has done a nice job looking at historical collect rates, setting up a reasonable allowance against that, but there is always going to be that lag to cash collections in the ambulance fund. But a good report for 2019. Uh, the environmental utility fund is one that the council has been monitoring and adjusting the rate structure to that over the course of the last several years. It is a very strong operating income each of the last several years. And it ends the year in 2019 with a $1.9 million fund balance in, a, in relation to your operations, uh, a year's worth of spending. As we talk about these utility funds, though, I do want to remind the council that unlike the general fund, where the fund balance is just there for operations and cash flow and contingency, have a capital component to them. And look at the fund balance or the net position of these funds. I would encourage you to consider what a reasonable operating reserve is for you and work with administration in the context of your uh, improvement plan to ensure that the capital needs are addressed as well if this is uh, where you plan to use, if that's where the plan for the resources is coming from. I know the Environmental Utility Fund, uh, you can ask for some capital expectations of this particular fund. Uh, recycling Project Fund, uh, a new trash fee was implemented during 2019. You can see the revenue increase as a result of that. And after four years of operating losses in this fund, uh, the first time uh, in five years, a small operating income of about $15,000. Uh, this fund has about a $300,000 fund balance, so we're looking at about uh, five months worth of expenses uh, in, in the recycling fund. Sanitary sewer fund is the second to last of the ones we'll be looking at tonight. Uh, this fund has generated operating income each of the last several years. Uh, as a fund balance to end 2019 of about $4.3 million, which is just short of a year's worth of spending. But with that reminder of the capital needs, that significant or even an insignificant sanitary sewer project, uh, the capital uh, reserves in this fund probably are not exactly where you want them to be. Uh, cash balance is about 2.8 million on a $4.3 million overall reserve. So again, a comfortable place to be from an operating standpoint. I think the question would be, what is a reasonable capital reserve for this particular fund? Uh, as forward. And now again, encourage that discussion, that dialogue with administration. Uh, the final fund is the street light utility fund. And this is where uh, a lot of franchise fees associated with the electric uh, activities of the city are showing up. You did increase the franchise fees and actually reallocated some of these funds to another fund within the city during the year for other operations beyond the street lighting. Uh, so it looks like this fund's revenue is down a little bit, but that's just simply the way it's allocated uh, from a greater pool. So uh, we'll uh, work with administration on what the amount that's going to be uh, the allocation in future years for this fund. But this fund has posted solid operating income each of the last several years, has a uh, $800,000 fund balance, so a very strong financial position. Uh, the allocation certainly seems reasonable to us for 2019. And again, as you have that new revenue stream coming in, you can work with administration and can decide what that allocation might look like in future years. So uh, I think uh, the 
Financial performance for the city, again, again across the board is very strong. Uh, fund performance was excellent. Your utility funds, your enterprise funds all seem to be performing uh, well. And I think the only advice that I would have is to get the dialogue going regarding what a reasonable capital reserve would be in each of your utility funds so everyone's on the same page regarding financial expectations and the expectations of financial position in these funds. So I will leave it at that. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you and I'd be happy to stay on the line for as many questions as you have. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And for council members and for those listening, uh, I just wanna remind everyone that our council has a an audit committee, which is uh, the mayor, myself, and then a council member. And it's our job to meet independently uh, with the uh, auditors separate and apart from staff. And this year, uh, Council Member Juniman was on the audit uh, subcommittee with me and we met and had another Zoom meeting uh, with the auditors and we were able to ask questions and review this report. Uh, and uh, I have to say that it's a very uh, excellent report. You folks did a really nice job and I would commend uh, Ms. Pulseth and the finance department uh, for uh, the way that they manage the finance uh, finances of the city. Uh, very pleased with the outcome of this and the transparency of it. And the fact that we can all be very proud about how we are stewarding the resources of our community. So with that, I'm gonna go around and ask council members if they have any questions for Mr. Mayor. Uh, council Member Smith. Uh, no questions for me, thank you. Okay, Council Member Knudsen. No, thank you. Council Member Neblet. None for me, thank you. And Council Member Juniman. No, thanks, minor answer last week. <laughs> okay, then I would entertain a motion concerning accepting the comprehensive annual financial report for the year ending 12-31-2019. Uh, Mayor, I move to accept the comprehensive annual financial report for the year ended 12-31-2019. Second. Okay. Moved by Smith, seconded by uh, Juniman. The motion to accept the com comprehensive annual financial report for the year ending 2019. Uh, council members, any further discussion? Council member Smith? Uh, just my kudos to the team, not only to Ellie and her team, but all the department heads for uh, um, their hard work managing the budget this year. So great job, everybody. Thank you. Council member Knudsen? No, thank you. Council member Niblett? Hear, hear what Brian said. Thank you. Councilmember Juniman? What they both said, because people think <laughs> that, you know, we got some credit from uh, our auditors, but at least speaking for myself, um, what we want doesn't necessarily compute at all unless we have competent people trying to make it work. That's our staff. Mm -hmm. So thank you, everyone. Okay, now for the vote, Councilmember Smith. Aye. Councilmember Knudsen. Aye. Councilmember Neblet. Aye. Councilmember Juniman. Aye. And I vote aye as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Ms. Paulseth. Moving on to our next agenda item, the new Maplewood Elementary School at 2410 Holloway Avenue East. Let's see. This one is going to be Mr. Martin. Are you presenting or is, I'm sorry, Mr. Thompson, you're presenting. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so we have a, um, the city has received a development application from school district 622 uh, for a project on the current site of the Maplewood Middle School on Holloway Avenue. Um, as the council knows and is aware, this is actually the third uh, school district project that has come through the entitlement process at the city as part of the school district's uh, district-wide facilities plan and uh, the referendum that was passed um, for those facilities. So the previous projects, John, Glenn, and Carver are under construction, and then this, this is the third project 
for the district in Maplewood for this year. Um, so the, the summary of the project is the school district is uh, proposing to uh, construct a new elementary school um, on this site. Um, it would replace then the existing middle school that is on the site, which would be demolished after uh, the elementary school is constructed. It requires uh, two uh, land use approvals from the city. The first is a conditional use permit and the second uh, is design review. So the site today um, is guided in our comprehensive plan for public or institutional uses um, that is consistent both with its current use as a school as well as the continuing use um, as a school under the application. It is zoned uh, single family, uh, but we do in our zoning ordinance allow schools in any zoning district uh, with a conditional use permit. So this application includes that request for CUP because the current school operation uh, predates the zoning ordinance requirement for the CUP. And then the second uh, item, the design review is really the city's, uh, the council and the CDRB's review of uh, the building and site, uh, the site plan and building in conformance with the city's ordinance requirements. So this is the proposed site plan uh, that has been submitted by the district uh, and its, and its um, design team. So the new school would be constructed on the south. So the current middle school is kind of on the north half of the lot. The new elementary school would be constructed on kind of the far south half of the lot. What this does is it facilitates the construction of the school, of the new elementary school, without uh, requiring the middle school to be demolished until the construction on the new, the new building is complete. The new building is, is roughly the same size as the existing building, so just under 113,000 square feet. It would have um, an increase in enrollment from the current 725 students up to 800 uh, elementary students uh, in that new building. Once the, the old building is then demolished, uh, that area would be um, converted into uh, fields, essentially play fields uh, for recreational uses for the district itself. The other thing to note is um, there has been some past uh, event parking uh, that's overflowed on the site and the district does expect that to, to be uh, reduced because of the elimination of the pool um, on the site it would be eliminated with the middle school and that function would no longer happen and the events that happen with this pool would no longer take place here on, on this uh, site. Uh, a couple other things just to note on the site plan is the separation you'll recall in the other school projects, uh, the district has is um, a part of their site planning separated both uh, student drop off and pickup that occurs during the peak times from the bus pickup and, and loading, uh, bus drop off and pickup. So in this case, the student, uh, so any visitor parking, staff parking and student pickup and drop off would all occur in that north parking lot which a single access point from Holloway Avenue. And you can see the long uh, drive access that allows for stacking uh, during those peak times. And then the bus traffic would use uh, Lakewood Drive. Um, there would be a new access on Lakewood Drive. Again, that's exclusive for bus pickup and drop off and as well as the, the uh, loading dock for shipping and receiving. In terms of the building design, um, it's pre pre uh, primarily a two-story building. Uh, there are some single, por single story portions of the building and the materials include a tan brick, uh, dark brick, as well as metal and precast uh, architectural panels. A Couple of the design details that were reviewed by the CDRB is, is first the, um, just the site lighting. Um, there would be uh, lighting on the site to, for safety purposes for the par parking areas. Um, and we reviewed the preliminary uh, lighting plan and I uh, do believe it does comply with the city's ordinance requirements on illumination levels um, at the property line. The second thing is just the amount of landscaping. The preliminary plans that were submitted with this development application do uh, include fairly minimal landscaping. And so this is a, a, a significant item that was talked about at the CDRB in really focusing on, on two areas. The first being um, significantly enhancing and providing additional screening on the east side of the building and parking areas to provide screening to the single family homes that are directly east of the site and whose backyards abut the school property. 
And a second condition that was added by the CDRB is additional screening for the, the kind of the service area of the building. So where that loading dock and drive lane are substantially enhancing the landscaping in that area with the a greater uh, diversity of materials and with a higher quality landscape plan to provide uh, just enhanced aesthetics, but also to provide some screening from the site improvements, which are shifting down uh, to an area of the site today that is primarily used for recreational purposes. So those conditions, both on the, the enhanced screening on both the east and west side of the sites are included as conditions of approval in your draft um, resolutions. So uh, as we do with all projects, uh, we did uh, send neighborhood surveys to all properties within 500 feet uh, because of the number, because of its close proximity to single family homes, that was a significant number. So there were 172 uh, properties that were notified. We did receive uh, 10 responses, all of which were included in your packet. And as we have been doing uh, recently with the form, with the change into um, uh, the online meetings for both the CDRB, the Planning Commission, as well as the Council, we did uh, post a presentation of the project, a video presentation of the project on our website. We still held the public hearing at the Planning Commission on May 19th. Um, and important to note is we actually had our first um, person testify or speak at the public hearing uh, at that Planning Commission hearing. So with that, um, staff is recommending approval of the two development uh, application requests, and there are uh, resolutions in your packet um, which would approve these projects with the conditions that are outlined in the resolutions. So Mayor and Council, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Thompson, for that report. Uh, you know, I, I certainly read the comments from the public and the comments from CDRB and uh, the Planning Commission. And if I kind of put them into two different buckets, one had to do with kind of the condition of the streets in that area, potholes and that they uh, uh, need to be addressed. And uh, the other bucket would be kind of trees and planting. So uh, what I'd like to do is, is uh, get staff's response and it might have to be Mr. Thompson concerning the potholes and the condition of uh, Lakewood and I think Lakewood predominantly, maybe not so much Holloway, but uh, Mr. Thompson or Mr. Love, are you still on the line? Uh, Mayor and Council, yes, I am. So uh, for our streets, we, we do design the streets to be able to support uh, bus traffic. The existing uh, conditions of Lakewood, um, it is nearing the end of its structural life. Uh, however, this pro this particular road was actually looked at uh, as a potential CIP project back in 2007. Um, it, it, a survey was sent out to the residents along the road, and they voted not to participate uh, in a CIP project. We do have this in our 10-year plan. Um, it it is a future CI project uh, still. Um, as we move forward, I would not recommend doing a project until after the construction is completed so that we don't end up building a, a new road and then having the wear and tear of the construction activities as well. Um, it, in the meantime, our staff will continue to pothole patch and then also uh, this might be a candidate uh, for some of our spot paving uh, work that we do uh, to provide uh, relief to residents that are on roads that are still a number of years out from a CIP project. Thank you, Mr. Love. And uh, perhaps Mr. Thompson, can you talk about, I know that the school district did not submit a, uh, a plan in terms of trees and planting. And there was some question about the quality of, of plantings. Can you please comment on that? Uh, certainly mayor and council. Um, so yes, this the, the landscaping, on the site and the screening was a significant topic that was talked about both at the CDRB and Planning Commission. And that's really um, why those conditions are included in your resolution, which require um, a revised uh, landscape plan be submitted to the city uh, with the, all that additional screening and landscaping along the east and west sides. Um, with again, the comments that we typically have around providing a diversity of species, um, and uh, just the, the type of landscaping that's done, we would re then review that to make sure it's consistent with those conditions of approval and, and the comments we've received from the CDRB and Planning Commission, and then 
we would ensure that that landscaping is installed and constructed as part of the project itself. Thank you. And my last question, and then we'll ask for council questions too. What is the timeline projected for the construction of the new school and the demolition of the uh, what is now Maplewood Middle? Um, Mayor and Council, um, so I, I believe we do have a representative of the school district on the line or their architect, and they may uh, have more specifics about the exact timing on both of those. Certainly. Is that Sean Kelly? Uh, yes. Yes, it is. Good evening. Good evening. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. So um, the, the kind of high level schedule as it sits now would uh, essentially to begin construction uh, toward the end of the summer, uh, early fall, so likely September. And then that construction would continue uh, through April of 2022, uh, at which time, um, you know, the majority of the south side of the site would be complete, including the building. And then at the end of the 2022 school year, um, when Maplewood Middle is uh, done for that school year, then the demolition of that building and then the north half of the site um, construction would be completed by uh, the end of that summer so august of 2022. okay thank you very much for that let's see if council members have any other questions council member smith uh, no questions thank you council member knutson no thank you council member neblet yeah i just have a couple um I, there were a lot of comments, like you said, Mayor. Um, the one thing that I, that I picked up on was the, the amount of space for bus turnaround and whether or not there's going to be enough space to do that. Could, um, I think Mr. Kelly, is it? Could you talk about that a little bit? Mr. Kelly? Yeah, I, I get, yep. Um, I'm not sure it, I don't think Greg, our civil engineer is on the call. Um, do you have specifics about the question? Is it relative to buses being able to turn around in that bus parking area as you it's know, designed? Um, I'm trying to look. I, and it wasn't just one question. It was about, um, several people raised the question about whether or not there was going to be enough room for the buses to park, turn around, get out, and uh, things like that. The other question I have is, um, has the has the district had any conversation with these folks, or how? Uh, when were these comments taken in comparison to... Um, Just do we know when the when the comments were taken, and has there been any um, has anybody gotten back to the residents to answer their questions, Mr. Thompson? I think that's probably a question for you. Certainly. So, um, Mayor and Council, um, though, so when we first received a development application is when we send those neighborhood surveys out. So that would have happened at the very beginning of when we received the application back in. Um, probably like the beginning part of May. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how that times, I know the school district itself did some community engagement with the, with the neighbors. I, I don't know how that times with them. So perhaps um, they could answer that. But uh, usually what we do is we collect those comments. Um, we review them and then we incorporate any conditions or answers to those as part of our reports to the planning commission and CDRB. And all that has been uh, posted on the city's website. Okay. All right. Thanks. That's all for me. Thank you. Councilmember Juniman. Uh oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I this comes from both looking at the layout that Sylvia was referring to and the neighborhood comments. Um, the arrangement of the buses when they pull in and have to turn around and back out, that was a concern by some people. And uh, you know, it's a little hard on a drawing to figure out space-wise how that's gonna work, but it's a, it, it appears to be a possibly legitimate concern. And then I thought also the play space sort of looks like it's tacked on after everything else was planned. Like, oh, we need a playground. 
and it's kind of like right by the bus area. And I question if it's the size of it, but also the location. Is that a wise combination? And again, right. again, go ahead. Thompson, do you want to respond to that? And then we'll ask for Mr. Kelly's response as well. Um, yeah, Mayor, I don't, I don't know if I have any particular insight on that issue. On the bus loading, um, I do know that um, in working on other school projects, oftentimes what happens is, you know, this, the bus pick up and drop off is obviously all occurring at the same time or kind of in this condensed time period throughout the day. And so it usually kind of functions as a, well, what's the best analogy to use? Kind of a, a, a um, I'm not quite sure, but like as the, so on this, if you can see the site plan on the screen, all of the buses will kind of pull in to those parking stalls and either pick up or drop off the students. And they don't necessarily back out, but what happens is the buses that are on the far east side of the parking lot kind of start by going, just pulling forward and around that kind of circular turnaround at the east end of the parking lot, which then heads them straight and straight out. And they kind of go one at a time as they, there's like an accordion out on the site. And um, so they're heading out onto Lakewood. So it's not every bus having to pull in and back out it kind of functions all at the same time as, as they go in order out of the site. Okay. I, and it's hard to describe in, on, on, on over the phone, but that's kind of how it usually typically happens. But why the playground is put, is put there, I, I think perhaps the architect could best answer that. Mr. Kelly, can you respond to the location of the playground, please? Certainly. So I would just uh, echo the comments about the bus drop-off. Um, the buses would not be backing up at any time. As mentioned, they would pull in uh, and stack in the parking stalls that you can see on the site plan. And then in order to exit, they would just continue to pull forward and make their turnaround in the kind of widened section of that loop. Um, and then as far as the playground goes, the uh, the playground, uh, part of the criteria was to have that playground adjacent to the bus drop off because during the day, um, the bus area will double as hard surface play. Uh, so that playground is, is accessible from the student entry, which is on the east side of the building. Um, you can access the playground from the east side of the building without walking through the, the bus area if, in fact, there was uh, ongoing parking or anything like that in that area. But that bus drop-off does double as a hard surface play area, so striping for, you know, four square, um, I think you're going to have a basketball hoop, things like that. So having those two spaces adjacent to each other was important. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. The other constraint we have is you can see on the kind of north and the northeast side of the building, we actually have um, stormwater retention areas. So those wouldn't be ponds necessarily with standing water, but we do need those spaces for uh, the stormwater to flow into for treatment. And that's just a limiting factor on the site on, you know, how many options do we have uh, in terms of locations for a playground? So, Mayor? Yes, go ahead, Councilman Juniman. Thank you. Um, so the safety of the play area at dismissal time, for instance, will be reliant on staff supervision of getting everybody to their buses and so on and not allowing them on the play space? I'm just having a little hard time with the play and the buses. <laughs> I don't know what they're doing. Are you talking about the, the hard surface play area? No, no. No, no. No, the one that's a square on our map. Yep. So from the from that square that you're referencing, which would be the playground, there is a sidewalk from that space all the way into the building. That you know, so you can access that play area uh, from the building without walking through the the hard surface play area which is also the the bus loop. yeah but my question is at dismissal time because you know how kids are um this is going to be staff oversight then that kids go to, to their buses and other kids who aren't taking the bus will not be allowed on the playground or what because otherwise i you kind of see where kids could dribble onto the playground and be around where the buses are when they're not bus so kids. it is in Yep, it would be fenced in. I, I suppose the uh, the operation piece of it would be a question for uh, the district, I would think. So I don't know if Randy or Mike are available to help out with uh, the operations of how dismissal works relative to 
uh, bus pickup timing? It's just the location seems like it could become a problem, but I hope they have it covered, I guess, is my comment. And then, Mayor, one more, th one more thing. Go ahead, Councilmember Juneman. Thank you. Um, you already heard it from Mr. Thompson, but I can't emphasize enough that um, screening, 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 and appropriate landscaping is a big deal here for two reasons. The neighbors are requesting it and they live very close to this. And secondly, we kind of teach kids by example when we have a school building. So if we want to teach kids that Maple was an environmental city, we want sufficient trees and appropriate plantings. And they should be, if you ask me, striking, not something we thought of later. So you can't emphasize enough how important they are. Thank you, council members. I have one follow-up question. I know one of the residents wrote in about a concern about water issues. And mm -hmm. I think uh, Mr. Kelly, you talked a little bit about uh, the water treatment. Uh, are you aware that there was a water problem in someone's backyard uh, as for 47 years? When it rains, water runs off the higher ground that the school sits on and down into a ditch behind his house. Mr. Kelly. I, I guess I am not specifically aware of that particular issue. Um, I do know that from an engineering standpoint, uh, all of the stormwater on site, uh, whether it's from the, the roof of the building and or the parking lot surfaces would be managed on site through the storm retention system um, in the rain gardens that are currently there that are being preserved. Um, do you, I guess, in order to address the specific item, I, I, you know, we would need to know what what lot, uh, you know, we'd be looking at just to make sure we're not impacting that condition. I believe the notes indicate that it's 1865 Mary Jo Lane. Can you please take that uh, and staff too? Um, I would ask that staff would follow up about the residents' concern about water runoff and that this new project is not going to have a negative impact on their property, but rather that the new uh, stormwater treatment and the rain gardens would adequately address those issues. Mr. Thompson? Certainly, yeah, Mayor, we can um, uh, confirm we, you know, we've reviewed this preliminary plan, which provides all of the stormwater facilities, but we can, in our final review, ensure that it's, it's uh, not impacting those neighbors that are uh, concerned about it. Thank you very much. Do we need to do anything to add that in, or is that sufficient that we've highlighted it for you during our discussion? Um, Mayor, I, I think it's sufficient. I mean, there's a condition in the resolution that says final uh, plans need to be approved by the city engineer. So I think that covers us on, on the stormwater issues. Okay. Thank you very much. I just want to make sure that we get that taken care of for the, for the neighbors. Are there any other questions? Mayor, this is Kathy Council Zuneman. Okay, Councilmember Juneman. Um, one thing about, I meant to ask Mr. Love, um, there were a couple of people that were asking about traffic control on Lakewood Drive and how at busy times, people in the neighborhood have an issue with trying to get out of their driveways. Now, is that possibly going to be better by, because this is situated differently or when you have elementary school kids, possibly more of them take the bus? I don't know, but there were two different people that brought that up from the neighbor. Mr. Thompson? Yeah, um, Mayor and Council, so the site today actually has an access on Lakewood Drive, but it's it's share, it's on the far north side of the site. I can go back to the um, right. uh, aerial photo. So you can see here, uh, you can see just on the far northwest corner, there's actually an access on Lakewood Drive. So part of the bus and all of the traffic that's coming to the site, in addition to being able to use Holloway, there is that access on Lakewood. This site, as I mentioned, the only traffic now that will be using um, Lakewood is the bus, the bus pickup and drop off. So the one time in the morning and one time in the afternoon, there is no physical way to get between those parking lots. So there's there all the traffic to the school that's not buses would all be using that Holloway access, which is much further to the east. 
um, okay. and has that great that larger stacking area for the drop off, so it, it has a less tendency we'll, to flow we'll out onto Holloway. That would take care of this. Okay, thank you. Okay, council members. Then we have two motions before us. Uh, do I hear a motion? I move approval of the conditional use permit resolution for the new Maplewood Elementary School at 2410 Holloway Avenue East. Second. Moved by Juniman, seconded by Neblet. The motion to approve a resolution for a conditional use permit for a new elementary school to be constructed at 2410 Holloway Avenue East. I think we've had a pretty robust discussion, so let's move to the vote. Uh, Council Member Smith. Hi. Hello. We'll come back I, to. I said, I said, oh. I said I. Oh, sorry. Councilmember Knudsen. Aye. Councilmember Neblet. Aye. Councilmember Juniman. Aye. And I vote aye as well. There's a second motion concerning design review. Is there a motion I for move, that? I move design review <clears throat> approval subject to all the conditions by the commissions, the staff, and the staff resolving the issues we raised tonight. Second. Moved by Juniman, seconded by Neblet, and I hope City Clerk Sint that you've got all of those provisos on there. <laughs> uh, let's see if there's any further discussion on this. Discussion, Councilmember Smith? No, thank you. Councilmember Knudsen? No, thank you. Councilmember Neblet? No, thank you. Councilmember Juniman? No, thank you. All right, then let's vote. Councilmember Smith? Aye. Councilmember Knudsen. Aye. Councilmember Neblet. Aye. Councilmember Juniman. Aye. And I vote aye as well. Uh, council members, we removed uh, item number three from the agenda tonight. Our last agenda item is the property maintenance code. And Mr. Thompson, this is yours as well. Thank you, uh, Mayor and council members. Um, so, get this working. Um, so as the council is aware back uh, in September of last year, um, the city adopted an ordinance establishing a rental housing licensing program. Um, and and the, the gist of the ordinance is that all rental properties uh, in the city are required under this ordinance to be licensed by the city. The three primary goals uh, for the ordinance, the first is just to maintain the city's housing stock uh, to make sure we're providing well-maintained and, and safe properties. The second is to provide a safe community. And then uh, thirdly, just to enhance our neighborhoods. As we, as the council has uh, uh, adopted that ordinance, we are kind of finalizing our implementation to, to launch uh, that program very soon. And I know as we've gone through that ordinance work, uh, we have discussed um, updating the city's property maintenance codes. And that's really the action before the council tonight, which is to adopt as our uh, housing, as our, as our property maintenance code, uh, the international uh, property maintenance code. So our ordinance, our city code today um, regulates uh, properties in a, a number of areas. It's not just uh, one section of the code. So we've listed some here that are particularly pertinent around uh, code enforcement and property maintenance. And that includes nuisances, abandoned vehicles, swimming pools, and our comprehensive solid waste. But what's fairly unique to Maplewood is that we actually have adopted kind of our own housing standards. And we have done, and our current code has done that by actually separating the top two here. We have a, a rental housing maintenance code and we actually have an owner occupied housing maintenance code. There's a ton of overlap, um, but uh, they are separate and they do have some different provisions. And so what we, our staff is, is recommending and included for your consideration is essentially um, rescinding those two uh, housing codes that we've adopted and in its place adopting the International Property Maintenance Code. It is a code that is uh, published and it's reviewed and adopted by the International Code Council. It's actually the same body that uh, regulates and adopts the building codes, uh, the international building codes for both residential and commercial. 
And is uh, because they do this, um, you may ask, well, why are we adopting the 2018 edition? Um, it's actually the most recent edition. So the, 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 the ICC adopts or reviews uh, the, the International Property Maintenance Code every three years. And so the most recent edition is the 2018. But one of the benefits of going with the, the IPMC is that it is regularly reviewed um, and updated to um, address um, kind of emerging trends or things that are not currently addressed in the code. Probably the, the main reason that, that uh, we think it makes sense for the city to do this is because we've adopted our, our own housing codes and because we you know, don't regularly update them, we have just found that enforcement is more difficult in, in administering our code. So there are gaps in our, our housing codes today um, and there is some ambigu ambiguity in, in what the code requirements. Whereas when we've reviewed the IPMC, it's a very detailed but very specific uh, and provides clear and specific guidelines around housing maintenance. To note just on the actual year, um, we have, we are recommending that we not actually automatically adopt future editions. So in 2021, there would be a future edition or update to the IPMC. We are not recommending that we automatically adopt that as part of this ordinance, but we anticipate that as each of these new codes come out, we would review them at staff, determine if um, there's any concerns or issues, and we just bring back a code amendment um, to adopt those future codes as they become available. So what uh, what will the, the IPMC do? Um, I, I think it can be fairly summarized in, in a couple ways. One, it will help uh, meet the goals of the rental licensing program. So I think a lot of the feedback that we heard uh, at the council uh, at your meetings as well as our community engagement around the rental licensing program from property owners was con wanting to make sure that the program is, was administered fairly, um, it was clear and it was consistent. And so we think the IPMC is a better tool uh, to provide kind of that clarity, fairness and consistency in administering the inspection component of the rental licensing program. So that, that's, the, the, that's a, a significant portion of why we're recommending this. Um, the second, uh, one of the second pieces, is it, it does provide some additional exterior requirements. So our housing codes today are very focused on interior elements of the units. Uh, but uh, this, the code would provide um, more regulations on the exterior. So things like a safe, you know, like sidewalks and driveways, making sure that they're uh, safe, handrails, that type of thing on the exterior of the property. And then the th the third piece, um, what we don't include in our code today is we don't actually have any occupancy limits. So based on the size of bedrooms and living spaces, we don't currently establish the, num the maximum number of people that can live there. Those regulations do exist in the IPMC. So it would establish some occup occupancy limitations based on the size of a, of, a, of a dwelling unit. And lastly, because it is kind of, um, connected or, or consistent with the building code, it actually references uh, a lot of the building code requirements. So it brings in some of those uh, life safety, fire and electrical requirements from the building code and makes it enforceable under the property maintenance code as well. So those are kind of the, the, the main um, benefits that we see uh, to, to adopting the IPMC. We are not, uh, the, the draft ordinance before you does not adopt the en entire IPMC. We've actually uh, spent a lot of time going through it and identifying um, items in our current code that we already regulate well. And actually uh, we prefer our current regulations over the IPMC's regulations. And so this is just those list of things that we are not uh, adopting the IPMC requirements, but we are actually retaining what the city currently does on these seven items. So that just includes our violation process, our process around issuing notices and correction orders, um, the appeals process, um, and then some of our specific regulations for long grass, abandoned vehicles, swimming pools, and our solid waste. As, as the council knows, our solid waste ordinance is very comprehensive. Um, I think the section in the IPMC is like two sentences long on solid waste. So we, we thought ours was uh, uh, much better on that. So we're, we're confident that as we've reviewed everything in, in detail, we've kind of got the best of both. We've got what is working well in our codes today, uh, but adopting the, the IPMC 
where we think we can uh, provide clearer and better ex uh, requirements going forward on those items. So with that, um, I should note that back, uh, um, I think it was the end of last year, we had actually brought this to the Housing and Economic Development Commission, HEDC. So since they uh, had kind of reviewed the rental licensing at one of their meetings last year, we actually brought uh, the housing, this the IPMC to them to, to discuss the implementation. And uh, they did uh, recommend that the city adopt the IPMC as part of our implementation of rental housing. So with that, uh, we there are two actions being requested by the council. The first is to adopt the ordinance uh, that would repeal um, our current housing code provisions and replace it with the 2018 IPMC with the modifications. And then secondly, adopt a resolution allowing for summary publication. So with that, Mayor, the, the ordinance would be effective upon publishing in our official newspaper, and we would begin administering um, the, the property maintenance code um, when it becomes effective uh, in a week or so. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. I have a question. Uh, you know, we've been working on this for quite some time. Uh, and we adopted, you know, the ordinance back in September of 2019. Can you kind of give us an update for the council and also for those listening on where we are? I know that we have hired uh, a housing inspector. Can you give us a little bit of uh, background about how we are implementing this or will be implementing this? And then also kind of the timeline when we expect that we will be uh, starting our first inspections of rental housing uh, in our city. Uh, certainly, Mayor. Um, so yes, we have been working very hard on getting this program um, launched and underway, and we are very close. Um, in terms of what we've been doing uh, this year in 2020, we have hired uh, the two staff in community development that will be uh, administering the program. So we've hired our neighborhood preservation specialist, Sam Drury, um, who will kind of be the, the lead on the housing code and inspection component. Um, she has experience. Uh, she is actually came to us from the city of Cottage Grove where she administered their rental housing program. So a significant amount of experience in managing a similar program. And then we have also um, Alfreda Ma Clark uh, started with us uh, about three or four weeks ago. Uh, to help on the administrative side of uh, the licensing process. So they are on board with us. Um, they are well underway and getting uh, familiar with our program and then ultimately working to, to finish all of the kind of uh, systems and applications and processes to figure it out. So we are there. I will tell you our everything is ready to go. Uh, we are just, the final step is just to launch it in conjunction with our new software program for licensing. And we expect that to happen uh, in August. Okay, and thank you. Just as a reminder too, uh, can you just comment about the fact that uh, this program is designed to pay for itself? Uh, can you kind of explain that? I did have a question about, you know, at this time with COVID, how is it that you're hiring staff? Uh, can you kind of uh, address that please for those listening? Thanks. Certainly. So, uh, Mayor and Council, uh, when when you adopted the program uh, in September, and then when we adopted the fee schedule um, at the end of last year, we um, at staff did a kind of a comprehensive analysis to say what are the staff and costs that the city will have to administer the program, and then what are the fees that will be needed uh, to support uh, those expenses of the city. With the the goal of, I always say, uh, two ways. One that uh, the the city's general taxpayer is not um, is not paying for the program itself. That it's the the rental properties themselves as as their license fee is actually paying for those expenses, and that is true. But also, you know, to also ensure that you know the the rental property license holders, so the property owners and landlords, um, aren't uh, paying excess fees that we actually create revenue on. So it's kind of we try to create the greatest balance that the fees. For the, to obtain a license from the city, cover the city's costs uh, to, to administer the program. And that's how we have set those fees and we will continue to monitor them to make sure um, that, we're, that we're continuing to do that. Thank you. And what I really appreciate this program is, you know, when you provided the background, I mean, the real reason for this was to make sure that we've got clean, secure, well-maintained, 
crime-free housing, rental housing for residents in Maplewood and that uh, we have some standards and that we know that certainly we have some excellent landlords in Maplewood. There's no doubt about it. But we also have some very troubled and troubling properties. And this is a way to uh, make sure that we are really uh, enhancing the safety of our rental units and, and improving the standards in them as well. So with that, council members, questions? Uh, council Member Smith. Just, uh, just to be clear, th these will be consistent guidelines for both uh, rental homes as well as uh, owner occupied? Uh, Mayor, yeah, Mayor and Council, that is correct. All, the regulations would apply equally to, to all properties. And then uh, with the maximum occupancy rules, uh, I, I assume those are flexible enough to accommodate larger families? Yes. Yes, Mayor and Council, they are, they are hardly onerous. I, I don't know the exact numbers, but I, it, it does allow larger families to live together. Um, we did confirm that they're not onerous requirements and maximum occupancy. Great, thank you. Councilmember Knudsen. No thanks. Councilmember Neblet. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, Mr. Thompson, you know, I remember when we had um, the public hearing on these new, well, when you were trying to develop um, the whole coding process and everything. And what I remember is that some of the larger apartment owners were concerned that there would be kind of like double requirements for inspections um, because HUD had their own inspections and then the city was gonna have their inspections and we're kind of gonna be doing the same kinds of things. Is it safe to say that um, with this new let me get it right. IP. What is it? The IP. Whatever. C. Yes. IPMC. The IMP. Yes, that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is it safe to say, or, or is it reasonable to assume that these same kinds of inspections, kind of, that will be happening, kind of coincide with? Um, the kinds of inspections that HUD would do and that somehow or another there wouldn't be any like double inspection on top of each other? Uh, certainly, Mayor and Council. So we haven't done a comprehensive look of all of the HUD regulations on what they're inspecting versus the IPMC, but I'm confident to, to know that the, the city's focus is, is narrow and we're not looking to overlap and to um, regulate properties differently uh, okay. and inspect pro uh, properties against different standards than what other requirements are already in place at either the state or federal level. Okay, cool. Well, I, in reading this, in reading this new code, I do think it is clear and it is fair and I hope people can um, do it consistently, but it seems really understandable. And uh, well, good luck. Thank you. Councilmember Juniman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, I, I think this has been a long time overdue. I'm so glad that we said, let's get going and that our staff has taken it on. Um, and there are two, in my mind, there are two reasons. First of all, that everyone, whether you own or rent, has a decent place to live. But I also think it's going to help neighborhoods because, you know, many neighborhoods have one or two problem properties or troubled properties, as we call them. And people get so frustrated when they don't know what standard to expect and how come they can look like that and blah, blah, that whole thing. I think this is going to help the problem of people seeing that everybody's property should be nice because then we're all better off. We all like where we live. So I, I just think this is going to help everyone. So I really thank staff for getting on this and, and taking it on. And I think it's, like I said, been long overdue. 
Thank you, council members. Uh, we have two motions before us. Do I have a motion? I move an ordinance repealing the rental and owner occupied housing maintenance codes and creating a new property maintenance code and adopting in part the international property maintenance code with certain modifications. Second. Moved by Juniman, seconded by Neblet. The motion as outlined in our packet. I'm sure uh, City Clerk Sint can take it right from the packet. That was a long one. Okay, further discussion, Councilmember Smith. No, thank you. Councilmember Knudsen. No, thank you. Councilmember Neblet. None for me. Councilmember Juniman. No, thank you. Okay, then all those in favor, Councilmember Smith. Aye. Councilmember Knudsen. Aye. Councilmember Neblet. Aye. Councilmember Juniman. Aye. I vote aye as well. And we have a second motion that requires four votes. Is there a motion? I further resolve authorizing publication by title and summary of said ordinance. Second. Moved by Juniman and seconded by Neblet, the motion to adopt the resolution authorizing publication by title and summary. Uh, Council Member Smith, is there any discussion first, Council Members? No, thank you. Council Member Knudsen? No, thank you. Council Member Neblet? None for me, thank you. Council Member Juniman? No, thank you. Hearing no further discussion, now on to voting. Council Member Smith? Aye. Council Member Knudsen? Aye. Council Member Neblet? Aye. And Councilmember Juniman? Aye. I vote aye as well. And that concludes the business portion of our council meeting. And what I'd like to do in closing, uh, you know, this has been a really challenging time with the pandemic, with extended restrictions, uh, recently with the killing of George Floyd at the hand of four Minneapolis police officers the ensuing protests and then riots. And, you know, I think it was probably the first time that Maplewood has ever had a curfew. Uh, we had a curfew for a couple of days and I wanted to invite my fellow council members to weigh in with their thoughts on uh, the time that we find ourselves in right now. So with that, council member Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Um... Thursday of last week, I took my 11 year old son down to Lake Street and then to 38th in Chicago. And sometimes it takes seeing things through a child's eyes to, to really appreciate and understand the gravity of it. And one of the things that Zachary said was, I, I just can't imagine being a kid and living in this neighborhood and, and how frightened I would be. And to think about his empathy for what it would mean to be afraid of those that are there to protect you and how uh, heartbreaking that was, was, was pretty incredible. Um, I'm proud of the work we've been doing in Maplewood. I feel like we have, uh, we've leaned into this conversation. I think the work that we did with the task force, the work that Chief Nadeau is continuing to do, it, it has, in my mind, decreased the, the fear on both sides, both from, from the fear of, of residents, in particular residents of color, as well as the fear of police for being, for being criticized and persecuted for the actions of, of a few. Um, I think opening that conversation has been a, has been a great avenue for, for uh, reducing those anxieties on both sides. And I think that's a really critical first step. Um, but I am, uh, I am hoping, hoping, hoping that some good will come of this. And, and I do think that um, I have hope for that. And I think it, I think it will happen. Um, you know, as a white middle-aged male, I will never understand fully what it means to be a person of color in America. 
it's it's not fair to think I ever could understand. But what I will do is I will stand with them. I will stand with my my fellow residents and and do what I can to help. And I think that's that's all we can ask. So thank you for the opportunity, Mayor. Hello? Mayor, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. I could not make that little button work. Uh -huh. uh, what I said was uh, I wanted to thank Councilmember Smith for his heartfelt comments and for his candor uh, during this challenging time. Uh, I really appreciate your comments. Um, so with that, Councilmember Knutson. Well, you know, I'm older than most, so I remember the 60s very well. And, um, you know, they were effective protests at that time. Unfortunately, things didn't change as much as we had all hoped, uh, but we keep on trying. So even during this time of COVID, I've said in the past, um, you know, that I think uh, there's going to be a reset. And, um, you know, when things like this occur, you start to think of your own situations and your own um you know do you really have prejudice are you really open-minded um but i think this time um i think the reset is actually going to occur um people are thinking deeply into their own situations and and have i actually uh, unintentionally or with a joint in, in some kind of uh, discrimination whether collectively or individually so i think everybody that I know and everybody that I see and everybody I work with is really starting to take a, a very, very self um, review of their own situation and realize that just being passive and not a bad guy, not a racist or whatever, probably isn't enough. So I think um, I really appreciate this council. I appreciate what uh, uh, Scott Nadeau has, has said in his emails and what he said tonight. And I really feel that um, the dialogue with police and the dialogue with the community is really gonna help. Thank you. Council, thank you, Council Member Knudsen uh, for your comments. Council Member Neblet. Thank you, Mayor. This has been really hard for me. Um, I wrote something down. I'm going to try to read it. <laughs> so just bear with me here. <clears throat> I stand in solidarity with the protesters across the country who are responding to the countless murders of black men and women across this country for the past 400 years. As a black woman whose family comes from Georgia but has lived in Minnesota for the past 30 plus years, and has three black Hispanic young adult children, I understand the terror. I also understand wanting to change things. That's why in 2016, our city called together a 13 member citizens panel to look at the use of force policies and make recommendations. We spent five months meeting every Thursday to learn, to build relationships and imagine how things could be done. This was not easy or fast, but effective. Guided by President Obama's 21st century policing and the hiring of our, of our public safety director, Scott Nadeau, our police department is committed to community policing. We are extremely fortunate that we as a city and as a public safety department have done some of the work that allows officers to protect and serve. If you look at the Maplewood Public Safety Annual Report for 2019, you'll see exactly what our officers are doing in Maplewood. When someone defaced the mosque in our city, it was the police officers that went and power washed the building to remove the hateful language. Yes, they do arrest people, they investigate crimes, 
but they also look for opportunities to build relationships in service to our community. Of course, we can always do better, but I also think we are so far ahead of many police departments. We will continue to do better. I'm proud of the work that the Use of Force Task Force did, and I'm proud of the work our police officers continue to do. Please let me be clear. I'm under no illusion that policing isn't a hard job or that things can happen. Mistakes will be made. However, I'm confident that the work that has been done so far, we are in a much better place than many. We are a city that will fight for equity, equality, and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Neblett. Um, I really appreciate your comments and, you know, justice for all. When I led us all in the Pledge of Allegiance, those are the last words that we said. And uh, we really do mean that. And I appreciate all of your work with the Use of Force Task Force and your candor with everyone tonight. Uh, Council Member Juniman, closing comments. Okay, first I have to say, wow. And uh, I can't tell you what it means to me to follow Sylvia. Um, <laughs> but first of all, I really would like to thank all of our staff again. And I mean everybody, IT, planning, engineering, DMV, finance, parks and rec, everybody. And of course, public safety for getting us through the pandemic, and then a step further now, still being able to open up and offer a few more services to people in an even greater time of uncertainty. Our staff is really dedicated, and I think we owe them a debt of gratitude. And um, we have neighbors of color, very Latino, and there are two young people, a 21-year-old and an 18-year-old. And the 18-year-old young man who is an incredible young person said, told me this past summer, he said, you know, I'm very fortunate to have been raised here. They moved in when he was like, not quite two. And, and he said, and yet I have had some feelings of what it feels to be like on the outside, particularly in school. But he said, I have to say living in this city is very comforting. And that really struck me. He lives right next door to me. I know he comes from a background that hasn't always enjoyed this. And he's comforted by living here. Incredibly wonderful to hear. And he's going to be a magnificent, whatever he decides to be right now, he wants to be a lawyer. And he said, I'm going to take with me the things I have experienced here. That's a wonderful thing to hear as somebody in my position. And he was just saying it to me as a neighbor. And that brings me to, again, thanking our public safety people all the time, everyone in police and fire and EMS, and especially the chiefs and the public safety director, especially in the last two weeks. How incredibly difficult it must be to do their jobs now and how well they continue to do them. So all I can say is thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm pretty sure I speak for almost everybody who lives here. I, I never thought, as did anyone, I suppose, but that I'd be in office to go through something like this. I think at the end of this, now I can say I've done it all. Um, and finally, I would ask our citizens to continue to observe hand hygiene and social distancing and any other safety measures were asked to follow because the pandemic thing is not over. And there are compromised people, not all living in protected environments or congregate environments, but in their houses who need and appreciate the fact that we will continue to try to live safely. And again, thank you to everyone. And I've sat on a lot of councils now, and I have to say this one is in my mind, the most outstanding. We have faced some big things, but I just appreciate the way we're meeting them. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Juniman. And thank you, staff, 
Uh, thank you for all of those listening tonight. Uh, certainly our work is cut out for us. I am confident that we will take this opportunity and time to really bring and usher in new change uh, to our community. We will continue along the positive path that we have taken over these last uh, four years in really bringing change and uh, uh, equity and inclusion into our community. I would just leave everyone with this, that we would each individual ask what we can do individually to help bring about that change. Because as a council member, as the mayor, I assure you that we will continue to ask what we can do to encourage that type of true change in our community and how we can make that happen. So with that, council members, I am going to adjourn and I thank you all for your participation tonight. Uh, and please stay well, take care, uh, and we'll talk, uh, hopefully we'll see each other, some of us might see each other at our next council meeting. So with that, we are adjourned, council members. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs>